Well, thanks so much to the organizing committee to, for the invitation to come and talk to you today about data visualization. Um, it is the thing I'm passionate about. I really love to help people make sense of their data. Uh, what I want to share with you today was beautifully motivated in the fireside chat by Lori and Caitlin, especially when they said that, you know, even though there's a lot of discussion around machine learning and algorithms replacing people, there's this really important thing that we as humans bring, and that's knowledge. Not all the knowledge we have is in the data. And this is where visualization is so important to data science, because it is, it is the mechanism that helps people bring their knowledge to bear and to make decisions. And so I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to give you an example of this. Um, and it's a story about someone who was trying to answer this question, how do you compare the genomes of a human and a lizard? So my collaborator, Manfred Grebherr, who's a computational biologist, is trying to answer this question by comparing the genomes of different species and looking for regions of similarity between the two. Ultimately, he thinks these sorts of comparisons will shed light on how our own genome encodes who we are. When I first started working with Manfred, he was looking at his statistical results using very straightforward plots like this one. So what we're looking at in this dot plot is one human chromosome compared against one chromosome from that of the lizard. And then each one of those dots inside this plot is representing a region of sequence similarity between these two chromosomes. So the A, T, Cs, and Gs in those locations of the chromosome roughly look the same. But the reality of his analysis was you know, a little closer to this, where he was having to look across many, many of these plots. And one of his data sets we looked at was producing over 300 of them. So he told me that not only did he find these very unintuitive and overwhelming, but what we found out in hindsight was that they were actually hiding some very critical subtleties in his computational results. I worked with Manfred for um, a couple of months and designed a new tool called MISB. And here I'm showing you a screen capture from just one of the views in that tool. And MISB is designed to support data like Manfred's, data that's complex and multidimensional. And at the time, is one of the first tools to really be able to explore this type of uh, genomics data. So what we're looking at in this view, in the outer ring, we're looking at all the chromosomes from that of the human genome, and the inner ring, all the chromosomes from that of the lizard. This inner ring also contains one user-selected chromosome from the outer ring that is emanating a set of colored lines. And each one of those lines represents a region of similarity, of sequence similarity between the two genomes. So using MISB, scientists can quickly explore their complete data sets and context and to develop um, some intuitions about the interesting types of patterns and trends that could be contained in the data. So this is actually a, a screenshot from the very, very first data set Manfred loaded into the tool. Now, by some measures, this is a relatively aesthetic image. There's lots of colors and there's circles and everyone loves circles. But, but for Manfred, what he told me was that this was really ugly, messy data because he wasn't expecting there to be so many lines going to so many different places, and it went against what he knew to be biologically true. So he went back to his algorithm and spent a couple of weeks tweaking parameters, and he was able to get but this far. At that point, he decided to completely scrap the way that he was modeling um, this phenomena and instead developed a new model that gave him this data set. Now, he's since gone on to publish his results and release his software to the scientific community. And when I asked him later how long it might have taken him to make this breakthrough without this visualization tool, what he told me was, honestly, I don't think I would ever have gotten there. And this is because visualization played an important role, not just at the end where he needed to create some beautiful pictures for a journal article, but really all throughout his own data, um, his own scientific discovery process and in particular helped him confront things that he was unaware of at the time. And this is really, I think, one of, the, one of the ways in which visualization is so powerful to be brought in throughout the entire data science um, pipeline. So 
I find that people really like to talk about visualizations and they always you know, seem to, to think that designing visualizations is, maybe it's an art form, maybe it's about how well you can select nice colors or pick a beautiful typeface. Um, but it turns out that within the visualization community, we actually have a lot of very solid um, foundational principles about how we can design effective visualization tools. So most fundamentally, we have what we call visual encoding channels. And these are basically um, the very straightforward ways that you can encode different kinds of data. So for example, here what I'm showing you are the different channels we have for encoding numbers. And a lot of the early visualization research um, did controlled studies to try to understand what kind of visual encodings are most effective for us to make sense of data. It turns out for numbers, color is actually one of the hardest things you could use to interpret data, whereas spatial encodings like position along a common axis or length are much, much easier. And I'll, I'll, give you, I'll show you an example of this. How many people have seen a visualization like this before? Yeah, so, so you open just about any biological journal, you're gonna see what, this is called a heat map, you're gonna see heat maps that look like this. Never mind the fact that 10% of men can't even read this because of colorblindness. <laughs> but that's a side point. Um, so, uh, so a heat map is fundamentally, it's a matrix layout where each cell in your table is encoding um, the value there with a color. Okay, so let's break this down for a second. So here I'm showing you um, seven time series of six time points each. There's seven little strips, and I'm encoding this with color. Um, things that are green are low values, things that are red are high, and time is along the horizontal axis. So looking at these seven little strips, can you tell which of these time series are behaving in a similar way? Or maybe which one might be a, a, an offset in the time point from some of the others? But now instead, if I encode this with spatial position, where now that value is encoded as vertical direction, those sorts of questions are a lot easier for us to make sense of. And that's because as humans, it's easier for us to interpret changes in position than it is to interpret changes in color. And so within the design community, we have lots of these sorts of principles that help guide the way that we design more complex visualizations. But I want to stress that visualization, it's not just about a whole bunch of techniques that we apply and guidelines. Um, there's actually a lot of really deep thinking that goes into the design process itself, itself. How do we work with people in order to understand their needs? How can we translate those needs into things that we as computer scientists can design tools to support? The, the process model that um, we use in my group looks sort of roughly like this. Um, it's, very, it's a human-centered process model, so each step, step of our design process really involves close collaboration with the people that we're designing for. And so we need to evaluate our ideas all along the way. And this is a little bit more of an honest reflection of, of what that process looks like. It's incredibly messy, it's incredibly iterative, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And I think it's most fun because of this very first step, the understand step. This is where we have to understand the problems that our collaborators have and translate that into a set of requirements that we can design tools for. And the approach that we take is to do very deep collaboration with the people we work with, try to really understand their mental models and the needs that they have in making sense of data. Um, and it turns out a lot of times people have a really hard time articulating just fundamentally what is it that they need to be able to do to answer their, their question in the real world. Um, and so, you know, the, the process that um, I go through, I created a little cartoon. It's kind of indicative of what happens all the time. Uh, let's say the little blue person is a viz person and the little green person is a, someone like a biologist with a lot of data. Usually start something like this. The viz person says, hey, what is it that you want to visualize? And you get an answer like, oh, from patterns of conservation, we want to visualize the mechanisms that influence gene regulation. And to a viz person, this is kind of how it sounds. Um, and so I joke, but this really isn't far off from, from the experience that I have in working with people all the time. And so I spent a lot of time really trying to think, how can we go from a semantically rich real world task like this into sort of, you know, computer science speak? And so um, uh, what the idea is, how do you operationalize real world goals into actionable tasks? 
And so the, the key is, what do we mean by actionable? And actionable here means you need a set of tasks that directly reference the data that you are working on. Because a lot of times, the types of questions people want to ask are questions where you don't actually have exact attributes or measurements to get at those. So I, I'm going to illustrate this with a super straightforward example. Um, and let's say that I wanted to identify good directors, movie directors. Oh, we were talking about Netflix. Why not? And, so, and let's say that the data set I have is I've scraped some data from IMDb. But my data set isn't about directors. It's about movies. And movies are directed by directors. But I don't actually directly have, <laughs> sorry for the the puns, I don't directly have directors. So, um, so this isn't that actionable. And then there's this problematic good. Well, what does good mean? I don't know. Maybe it's an IMDb rating. Maybe it's how much money a movie has made. And so um, what we think about is how can we have a systematic, very engineer-focused way to take tasks like this and to make them actionable. And it turns out there's some things you can do. Um, so we have a model here um, where we think about tasks in terms of these three different kinds of components. The first one is an action, which is identifying what's the thing you want to do in the task. The second one is the object, or what are the items you want to do that um, action to. And then finally, the descriptor, which is the, the value you actually want to measure um, for the objects you're interested in. And so if we look at our simple example, um, we identify as our, ta as our action. Well, what do we want to identify? Ah, directors. As I said, we don't actually have directors in our data set, so we're going to make a proxy here. We're going to say, OK, director really equals movie. Maybe I can explore movies and infer something about directors from that. Then we um, identify our descriptor, which is good. And as I said, there's many subjective interpretations of what good is. Um, and so maybe I'm just going to select a high IMDb rating. And this allows me to then translate this fuzzy task into an actionable one, where I want to identify movies with high IMDb ratings. And this is something that we can build a tool to solve for. Um, and visualization can play a really important part in sort of defuzzing these, um, these sorts of concepts in order to create good proxies. Now, the way in a real world setting that we go about doing this sort of translation is through conducting a lot of interviews, both um, uh, uh, contextual as well as just um, uh, in discussions. We do a lot of our own exploratory data analysis, ju just getting in and seeing what's in there. Um, and we also do a lot of rapid prototyping, again, with this idea that you want to get your ideas out and get feedback as fast as you can. And we sort of started to call this process data counseling, because it's not so unlike when you go to a therapist and they're like, what's wrong? You're like, I don't really know. And then they ask you lots of questions to help you articulate it. Well, I feel like that's often the role that we play with domain experts who need help making sense of their data. Um, and so. Going back to the simple example, um, through the data counseling process, we're able to identify that really what we have here is we have a set of time series that this person needed to work with. They were looking for patterns, temporal patterns, in those time series. And they wanted to see how those patterns played out with respect to a binary tree that ordered that set of time series. So we take those, those um, more definitive types of concepts, and we can then design a tool, such as the one I'm showing you here, to actually support the scientists in asking that question. So, so um, within the data science process, I want to stress that visualization is important on both ends of this spectrum. So on one end, what, um, the examples I've shown you today are very much about exploration. It's about how can you generate hypotheses and validate those. And visualization is a really, really important part of that, in part because it lets domain experts bring their knowledge to bear on what the data is showing them. But there is this other really important aspect of visualization. And this is how, at the end of the day, how do we communicate and explain the stories that we discover in those data sets? Um, and this is another place where visualization is so important. And so um, I want to um, sort of end this talk by saying that we, as, as data scientists, I think we think a lot about this exploration and about tell and making stories, but maybe a little bit less so about how are we going to communicate those. And I think that right now, we're in a really, really interesting time in society. And there's a lot of exciting um, problems and, and, um, going on. And I think my guess is that everyone in this room and everyone listening has a lot of passion and a lot of empathy about the types of, about the types of um, challenges we have that we're facing. And I want to encourage you as data scientists 
to go out and use your skills for good um, and use those skills in a way that is also very empathetic and that remembers that at the end of the day, on the other end of our data sets are going to be people. And those people we want to convince, we want to disrupt, we want to impact. And to remind you that visualization is a really powerful way to do that. So I want to thank you all for the talk. And I know we weren't supposed to put any plugs in. I'm sorry, but um, my last plug is that I'm always looking for good, great uh, grad students. So, <laughs> OK. <laughs> Wow, I, I really think this is the nicest part of data science is the visualization. But it's also Me one too. of the hardest. <laughs> right, it's one of the hardest. Okay, we have time for questions. Behind you. Yeah. Hi. Um, can you talk a bit about the difference between static and kind of online visualization? Like I often find myself asking, should I make this in R or should I make a website? Or, yeah. and, and I'm interpreting when you say static versus online, you mean something that's interactive versus something that's just a static visualization. Yeah, I, th I think it's really interesting um, that uh, how interactivity has changed some of the underlying guide guidelines that we have for visualizations. Um, if you're creating a visualization that's going to be in print or on a poster um, and you don't have interaction, you really need to try in some ways to put as much information as you can in. Of course, try not to overwhelm people. but. And that, and that actually gets really, really challenging. And in some ways, interaction kind of takes care of that problem for you. Because with interaction, you don't have to show everything at once. Um, we have a variety of different kinds of design patterns for how you um, can design tools to support interaction and drill down. Um, and I think that that's a, a really important change from the types of guidelines people might have if they're looking for more static. Um, and, and interaction is, is, I think, one of the key things um, for, I'm guessing, any of the kinds of data sets that people um, here are working with. Large data sets, there, there is no magic visualization that you just don't know about that's going to magically show what you have, what you want to see. It's really about good design and breaking apart, you know, what are the different perspectives I can take on this data? How can I explore that to make sense of it? Hi, uh, I just have a quick question regarding how important it is when you're a visualiz visualization expert, how important domain knowledge is. So it sounds like from what you're saying that, you know, if you can create actionable tasks like action, object, and descriptors, you don't necessarily have to have the domain knowledge to effectively create a visualization. Would you agree with that or disagree? Yeah, so I, I think it's a really, really interesting question. And um, my own bias, because it's just the way that I work, um, is that I rely on, I have to learn enough so that I can ask questions and understand where my own gaps in knowledge are. But I actually think it's coming into a project somewhat naively in that way um, that I found in many instances that I just ask these sort of basic questions. And it sometimes confronts people with assumptions that they didn't even realize that they were making. And, and it, you know, it can even um, and, and sort of show some of their own gaps of understanding, forcing them to, to describe to you what it is that you do. And so I actually think that armed with a good toolbox of interview skills um, and observational skills, you don't need to know too much about a domain. Um, but you also, um, we don't go into it just blindly. I wouldn't just go and talk with someone in a field I've never, never like, um, thought about without doing some amount just to understand the language behind it. So it's, I don't have a concrete answer for you. Hello. Here. Oh, thanks. Um, my question is, what do you see as uh, the next greatest challenges in visualization, both from a technical and non-technical standpoint, especially in this era of trillion point data sets? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, I think on a, on a, in a technical perspective, it turns out we still don't have good tools for non-programmers to use to create very rich and unique visualizations. Um, so you take, for example, maybe people working in um, data journalism or designers creating infographics. Um, they're somewhat limited in what they can do with data um, unless they get some programming skills. Now, you could argue whether or not everyone should need to know how to program. But if you don't believe in that school of thought, then yeah, we don't have great tools yet that allow you to do that. There's great tools that you can create, you know, sort of standard statistical charts, but none of these more unique things. 
Um, there's also, I think, a lot of interest around the notion of visual literacy um, and uh, how do we get more people to be able to understand data and to do that through visualization. When um, I've been, you know, I heard a, a, the former director of the New York Times graphics department a couple years say, we will never publish a scatter plot because that's just too hard for the general public to understand. And it's like, whoa, that blew my mind. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I think the assumptions that we have as scientists, you know, don't always translate well as far as literacy, and so I think there's still, we still have a long way to go to get people to understand visualization and also just data. Great. Well, with that, Marais, thanks so much for coming out Thank from you. Utah. Thank you all. And talking to us. Wonderful.